Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again on the MBS Show. I have stolen control, and I am now your host, Silver Quill. But have no fear, the former host, and will be future host, is still with me. We have podcaster and planeswalker extraordinaire, Norman Sanzo. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? I can't hear them. Are they good? I hope they're good. If you're not being good, be good. Oh, no. Don't make me come over there. I hope they're good. Well, it's 2020. I'll understand if you're not feeling too good. <sighs> but that's why we decided to do something fun. For yes, today we're going to turn up the volume and yank out the knob. <laughs> because we've got it all. We've got it all on UHF. <laughs> so yes, this is a, a, t- a movie from way back when. When I saw it as in as a child, when I was nine years old. Wow. Came out in 1989, the towards the end of the 80s, starring Weird Al Yankovic. A movie that was panned so thoroughly he wondered if he had killed all the uh, critics' dogs without knowing it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, this this almost killed his career. Oh, well, that's something else. I mean, well, it's based on risk. But hey, he I say he more than bounced back from it. True, 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 true. And yeah, this this movie is just... <laughs> I, I like it. Um, I discovered this movie a little bit later in my life. Uh, when I was what, in the, in the two thousand something like that. Uh, two thousand and uh, I'm just thinking two thousand and what ten. Uh, it's the the, the mid two thousands. So um, almost twenty years after it first it debuted. No, not really. Almost debuted. Like when I saw it. Like when I saw it, I was a teen. Or pre-teen, no, teen. Teen and older. Oh, so last week. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> that's your whippersnapper. Me. But still, um, sorry for stealing your thunder, Silver. So, what do you have to say? Well, perhaps I should start with just giving an overall summary of this. We- Weird Al plays George Newman, basically an everyman with a wandering imagination, who comes into possession of a local broadcast television. And through... Some of the oddest talent you will ever see, he begins to build it up into something bigger. It becomes a number one rated show, beating out even networks, which puts him into conflict with R.J. Fletcher of the local network. And boy, things just escalate from there in absurdity and also sheer mustache twirling villainy. Now, rewatching this, because I don't think I'd really seen it since uh, 1989. And some jokes really hold up. Some I've quoted in my videos, which <laughs> is anytime you can get a little bit of quotation out, out of a movie, then it's done something right. At the same time, there were other jokes that just didn't really uh, jive with me anymore. And it's kind of funny to talk about the multiple styles of humor brought into this. So we'll tackle that bit by bit. Unfortunately, our friend Torterra, he could not join us this time, but... Uh, Maybe we can, for Patreon sponsors, we can ask him next time, did you watch UHF and what'd you think? Is it great movie or greatest movie? Yeah, let's just hope he watched it, at least just for the fun of it, because it is a fun movie. Like, the movie itself is not, <laughs> let's just say it's not a masterpiece, but it is fun. Like, how Kung Pao is, this is just fun. Like, just look, just watching Weird Al do his stick is just really awesome. So, we will pause very briefly to allow you to go and see the movie. I think it's only like an hour and a half. Yeah, an hour and... Let me double check. It's an hour and 30... Hour 40. Let's just round it up. An hour and 40. So, it's it's a good short view by movie standards. So, go on. Just enjoy it. We'll be here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're still here. Back? Are they back yet? Are they back? Yeah, I think they're back. I think they're back. Norman, I don't think they're really back. Oh no, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. Are you sure? What? Are you sure? Are you sure this isn't just a bunch of doppelgangers? Eh, I don't know. But let's just say they're back. Let's say they're back. All right, fine. Welcome, doppelgangers. So, even before we dive into this, I want to point out that the strangest thing is that. The straight man in all this is Weird Al Yankovic. Think about, think about uh, what funny things does he do outside of his imagination? Hmm. 
Not much, really. I mean, uh, there's the scene where he does a uh, parody of... Ooh, who's, who's that guy that does all the... Uh, the, the controversial talk show thingy. Oh, Jerry Springer? Yeah. Oh, there you go. But he, even there, I would argue that the, the humor lies in the absurdity of his guest hosts. <laughs> True. I mean, he's interviewing Satan for one, for crying out loud. <laughs> I, almost, I almost said for Christ's sakes, but I feel like that would be meta. <laughs> but, but here's, okay, as this starts out, we witness Weird Al, let's just say it's Weird Al, mm-hmm. going reenacting uh, Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. But here's the first form of humor we witness. This is very much in the absurdist nature of Airplane. <laughs> and, to, and to a much lesser extent, uh, scary movie, epic movie, meet the Spartan, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But this is just more absurd. Weird Al's character is taking this totally straight-faced uh, working through it as best he can, but all around him, in in there are ancient warnings, but also stop <laughs> signs. Please do not cross tape, and uh, caution: beware of punctured tires. His guide is, flees in terror and is hit by a bad green screen. <laughs> what is cool? It's, it's really dumb. Oh my god! A bad green screen is a train. <laughs> That green screen. I I have not seen green screening that obvious since uh, uh, oh gosh, the Jackie Chan and Jet Li movie, oh. Journey to the East. Oh, I think so. But e- either way, when you see bad green screen, it's almost com- comical in itself, yeah, which but, part makes it wonderful. But this was what nineteen eighty nine, so the green screen was okay. Yeah, we were getting there. Technology was still working on it. Mm-hmm. But we quickly discover that this is all happening in the head of George Newman. A, a guy who's drifted from job to job. In fact, as no sooner have we met him than he ticks off his boss and gets both himself and his friend Bob Steckler fired through what may be the longest throw in the history of, of cinema. Because they are going, whoa! <laughs> for a good minute and a half and yet they only land like 10 feet away I'd argue that there was a lot of verticality to that throw kind of an arc <laughs> yeah it seems that way like uh, Big Bertha Big Edna yeah Edna has a whew, she has a throwing arm <clears throat> but no speaking lines mm, true like cheese piss now we should I should mention that uh, Bob Steckler is played by David Bowie. Not that David Bowie. I keep telling everyone I'm not David Bowie. <laughs> but yes, this actor's name is David. Well, it's B-O-W-E. David Bowie? I guess Bowie? So. I guess. David Bowie? <laughs> now, I'll, I'll weigh in right here with David's character. He's really there for exposition. One of the awkward things, including as we meet... As we meet uh, both uh, Weird Al, sorry, I say Weird Al, George's uh, friends, family, his love, his love interest, uh, Terry Campbell, played by Victoria Jackson, mm-hmm. uh, and his uncle, his uncle. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to remember who his uncle, I man, I'm having trouble even remembering. I believe it's Filio, Uncle Filio, played by Anthony G- Geary. Mm hmm. All of them are basically summarizing George's life to him. They are telling him about the life he's already lived. You've wandered from job to job, and when are you going to take things seriously, and yada yada. So, right off the bat, we're painted with a very explicit picture of George. We don't know too much about everyone around him, other than the fact that they love to recount his life. But all that changes when his uncle Filio, uh, who is has a gambling problem, he loves poker. He especially loves the racetrack. He gets the deed to the local broadcasting station, which is basically on its last legs. In fact, he's quite uh, overt in saying so. And so his aunt, uh, George's aunt, says, "Hey, I know just the person to run it." And that is how both George and uh, Bob manage to become 
owners of a TV station. So, and all this happens in, I'd say, the span of what, 10 to 15 minutes tops? Yeah, I, I think they were just rushing in to get the story done, like just getting the content. Like, okay, this is what's going to happen. Uh, the Most of the brunt of the story is just going to be them running the TV station. And I don't mind it. Like, rushing through to get to that point is, well, kind of important, I guess, because nobody really wants to have a half an hour scene where how George gets the station. That's superfluous. Like, the main meat of the story is them running it. Now, Norman, I'd like to know your thoughts on just this sort of introduction. You, you've We meet several characters in relatively short order. The art form is pretty interesting. It's a rare breed of storytelling where you get certain characters in just to do uh, exposition, like the Exposition Express, <laughs> like the Friendship Express, where, okay, we are introduced to George, the main character, Bob, his best friend. Uh, why <laughs> We already know they're best friends because they get kicked out from work together and Bob doesn't want to bash George's head in with a crowbar because he still owes him five bucks. Haha. <laughs> uh, we then are introduced to uh, Kino, the karate instructor that lives above or has a dojo above the store and where George lives. And we are quickly introduced to George's girlfriend. But the important characters or some of the, what do you call this? Uh, the, the important part of the story are told. Uh, we are introduced to George's aunt, who is rich and also has... I won't say high hopes, but believes in him because he's a good guy. And then we are introduced to his uncle, who is a gambler, like you mentioned before. And he, like, it's really fast-paced. And everything is put into place where, okay, we get this, we get this. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a chain where George, okay, main character George. George has best friend, best friend. And then uh, George has a girlfriend. Okay, here's a girlfriend. And then uh, um, George is a bit special in terms of his mindset. So uh, I, I, I don't remember how he managed to go to the party that his aunt's doing. Then aunt introduce, Then we are introduced to the uncle, which is the husband. So, so everything seems to connect pretty neatly in how things are done. In my case, a lot of these characters highlight what I would consider to be the main prevalent humor in this uh, movie. Really? Especially Kino, who is oh, yeah. probably my favorite uh, of the humor. Kino doesn't really he does... play a big part, but he is my favorite. Especially the, <laughs> uh, especially when he gets his own show. <laughs> Actually, I think it's pronounced Kuni. Because uh, I hear Kino, and I think Ku of Kino's so, travels. Yeah, sorry, 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 it's Kuni. Why did Ku I say Kuni Kino? Played by oh Kuni. Because you're probably thinking of the anime Kino's Journey. Uh, yeah, probably. But uh, at the same time, too, I'm thinking about his store outside because I thought that is an O. My bad. Kuni is played by uh, Ged Watanabe. And he he's really the first taste of you have a guy who's relatively normal. <laughs> I put George Newman. He's kind of an Adam Sandler character. He's uh, misunderstood by everyone. He's a big dreamer, marches to the beat of his own drum in his head. But he has trouble fitting in with pop culture and they, or uh, the surrounding environment. And so he's put, he's, he's ostracized in a certain way. And everyone's disparaging of him. But we don't want him to look too bad. So we'll show, we'll surround him with some people who uh, have it worse. And we'll be, we'll follow up on that very shortly. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the humor is that George goes through this world where everyone is just bonkers Cooney is throwing people out of his windows and he has he uh george will ask for the time well a fist slams through the door with a watch on and he does a double check and he takes this all completely in stride the weirdest he gets is trying to feed a dog punch from a bowl and then leaves the dog in the bowl but it's kind of weird to see weird al playing the straight man it's it's true but at the same time too when you really look at it he 
lives in <laughs> I won't say that uh, he lives in a strange world but he surrounds himself with a lot of eccentric people because uh, as we go on we see a lot of uh, let's just say cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs kind of creep, uh, people uh, because what we uh, at a TV station we meet with uh, a quote unquote mad scientist uh, we see a lot of the people that he gets on the TV station are very special in their own way. To put it mildly. But what about you, Silver? What, what do you think of the quick pace intro? Like, uh, I, I say my piece, and I say it's a dying breed. Well, here's the thing. there are, We meet a lot of characters, but there's not a lot of interest in them. I gotta say, Terry Campbell, the love interest, is so anemic a presentation she she's just monotone she's there to look pretty and to shun him for for george for being a uh screw up but she has no real role in the story but at the same time too like i i think uh what uh terry terry is a good counterpart for george because she is grounded she's bland she just she's just there to quote unquote try to support George, but George here is kind of a dreamer, and is uh, forgetful and whatnot. So, I I think she's just there to just ground him, but George being George, <laughs> uh, he means well, but he's just you know he's forgetful. Forgetful, he gets lost his own head and in his work and in trying to be a success. Uh, and eventually, Terry does dump him for forgetting one too many times. Which leads to probably the creepiest scene in the whole movie, which I will get to a little later. Basically, we reach then... Okay, they've got, they've got ownership of this TV station. They are They meet their mad scientist who basically lives there and runs the, runs the programming. But then we are introduced to the antagonist of this story. While George is, is arguably his own worst enemy, we also have R.J. Fletcher. Oh, that R.J. Fletcher. Yeah. He, <laughs> he's, he's such a meanie head. Yeah, he's, he's corporate. He, he's the man. He, he stifles the uh, little man and stuff like, oh, uh, indies, bad indies, indies, bad. <laughs> All he needs is a top hat and mustache. Which, <laughs> I have to read something from the trivia page. Um, okay, uh, according to Weird Al, uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, R.J. Fletcher, would often break out in laughter after finishing a take in which his character was especially nasty. So, he even finds the character just <laughs> utterly silly. And this ties into the idea of filling this world with extreme characters. I think a lot of people would, would find this guy cliche. I mean, he's meant to be irredeemably awful and selfish. And so you want to see all the bad things happen to him. Uh, but that's part of the humor. This is, again, a world populated by extremes. And so if you if you stop trying to say... I think if you're looking for the characters to be really human, you won't have as much fun. It's more gets swept up in the absurdity. Which has, which is what they did in the very beginning, because uh, if they were to portray the world in a normal light, then everything or anything that other characters would do would be bad, would be just insane it would not make sense but for the very beginning of the movie they already shown that uh, not including where else imagination uh, that this is what the world operates in and this is how silly things are like big edna throws george and bob out and it takes them a while to land and what uh, Kino, oh sorry, not Kino, uh, Kuni, not Kuni, yeah, Kuni, Kuni throws his beginner level students out the window and calls them stupid. <laughs> what does that Which say? is probably the, the most quotable line from the whole movie. 
Yeah, that's true. No, 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 no. The, the quotable line for the movie is later on. I don't want to spoil it because it's just too good. Oh my god! But uh, we are we we are introduced to this world, like the, how insane this world is. Oh, by the way, uh, favorite part, favorite joke for the beginning of the movie is, uh, we got a bum who is asking for change, and Red L has. Um, a dollar worth of change, and the guy picks up a dollar and gives him a dollar like in paper, uh, in paper form. Like, I did not see that coming. <laughs> yep, again, populated with absurdities. It's like, and so and so, it's the straight man, but the world around him is is the humor. And yes, R R J and his his almost cl- cliche villainy isn't is a lead in <laughs> to. A very prominent character, Stanley Sp- Sp- Spadowski. Sp- yeah, let's get let's Spadowski. I guess so. Sp- Spadowski. Well, either way, it's a difficult name to pronounce. But here's the thing: you, uh, was it Channel sixty two? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm glad they weren't Channel sixty nine. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, the Stanley character is played by Michael Richards. Or uh, yes, Michael Richards. Uh, Michael Richards is well known to play uh, Kramer from Seinfeld. Ugh. And honestly, I feel like after Seinfeld, his career took a real downturn. Yeah, I, I guess people know him for um, Kramer, and he's typecast. I guess. Mm. He's also got a heck of a temper. He was, he was a. Uh, in a skit with Andy Kaufman, oh, when Kaufman sabotaged it, and you could really see his temper on display. Dude has a fuse. <laughs> but Stanley is sort of the culmination of the message that Channel Sixty Two is a place for outcasts. We earlier we are introduced to Pamela Frank uh, Finkelstein, played by the nanny Fran Drescher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She wants to be a news reporter, but she encounters some very blatant sexism. Her cameraman, who is a little person, he gets physically knocked over by other people. Everyone associated with this channel is kicked out. They're lo- they're more outcast than George, so he's a he's a median point, not accepted by the cult- culture at large, but not quite weird enough to be amongst the. Uh, outcasts that inhabit 62 and so stanley is the ultimate expression of this as he is fired and is basically weeping for the loss of his mop which he got when he was what eight years old yeah eight years old so he is given a job and once stanley once uh, george hits a low point he gives stanley the show uh sort of a howdy doody uh, Blinky the Clown esque show, and lo and behold, it is Stanley in his quirk and charm, and sheer what the hell <laughs> that gains an audience. Now I'll, I'll say this: uh, I, I glossed over the state of Channel sixty two because, in my eyes, this was the most boring stretch of the movie. It wasn't that long, but it felt longer. Yeah, I, I feel I felt that the. Uh, the, how do I put this? I felt that the part where them just showing us the mundane things that Channel sixty two is like how unsuccessful they are, and then them trying to do new stuff is, well, I won't say boring, but it kind of felt like it was dragging, but not really. It was really short, but I think that's the point. Like. This is how they are, and if they don't improve, they are screwed. They are. This it's they're one step away from bankruptcy, and being closed down. And but I agree with you. It did feel like it went on forever because it's not even terribly funny. I mean, there's a scene where a guy's finger gets cut <laughs> off, but that's just to break the monotony. Yeah, but I honest, I honestly feel like if George were a more expressive, reactive character. Like just passing out from sheer boredom, <laughs> that might have p- pushed it, uh, gotten more humor as a reaction, maybe be a proxy for the audience's boredom. But also at the same time too, uh, the ads, the ads for the 
sh- from <laughs> for the movie for the you know, for the station is pretty entertaining, uh, especially the first one, Spatula City. Uh, here's a trivia for you: for the short of Spatula City billboard, the producer bought a billboard on a remote stretch of highway. For months afterwards, the drivers thinking the exit would ask nearby business about Spatula City. The ad was finally removed after business complained. <laughs> honestly, you make honestly, it sounds like you should really just open a Spatula City. <laughs> uh, I guess that, that seems like a good concept. Well, whenever YouTube dries up, we've got a fallback business plan: Spatula City in the works. But anywho, uh. Sorry to interrupt. I, I I thought it was a good uh, trivia to read out. Basically, once Stanley uh, breaks through, it opens the door to have all basically the outcasts of of this community have a place to express themselves. And in doing so, Stan uh, George and his company become the champions of the downtrodden. This is very much playing to the classic underdogs versus the establishment. But again, George is really underplayed for the most part. I found it funny that going back into his dream sequences, they used the Weird Al uh, Beverly Hillbillies song. And I have no idea if this was that music video's debut or if they just added it because it's like, hey, it's a Weird Al movie. Hmm. Let me see if I can find trivia on that one. But it feels like the this <laughs> that music video was for the movie. Uh, give me a second. Carry on. Indeed I shall. Now, this, I think, is where the humor is most hit or miss, because we're really playing up the strangeness. I love Cooney's A Wheel of Fish. <laughs> which is just, favorite part. Just favorite part. Most quotable. <laughs> yeah. Most quotable. But then we have, uh, then we have this, uh, this wildlife guy in his home, which is loaded with animals. And he's throwing turtles on the ceiling <laughs> and and shaking up anthills. Probably the, the best reaction is between uh, George and Bob. As they say, why did you hire this guy? Why you hired him? How he got a TV crew is beyond me. But then, this is the thing I don't get about me. I laugh when Cooney throws his students through a window. When this, this wildlife guy starts throwing poodles out a window. And you see there's actually a pile of them below. I'm horrified. <laughs> I'm sorry. Apparently, I like dogs more than I like people. That is true. Um, the, the, <laughs> that, that reasoning or that mindset is um, as simple as this. Um, we as human beings love animals a lot. When we see, or in this case, dogs a lot. And when we see dog get hurt, we get uh, sad, get angry. Uh, this was done in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. The artist, the manga artist for Jojo, Araki-san, he mentioned that all of his villains are cruel to animals. Uh, they always get killed or hurt. And he mentioned that they, he wants you to have a negative reaction to the villains and it's a cheap trick to do so oh by the way um i have an update on the beverly hill beverly hill billy song um the beverly hill hill billy song is in the movie as is a spoof to dire straits money for nothing uh, using modified lyrics to bled off jet i cannot read this this is way beyond my reading level sorry not to worry. But I know that it was a, a parody of another song. That's Weird Al's M.O. But w- was it made before or f- before this movie or for it? I think it's for it. But by the way, uh, I click on the trivia in the chat. So for you to kind of read up. All right. The Beverly Hillbilly song in the movie is a spoof of Dire Straits, Money for Nothing, produced in 1985, using modified lyrics to Ballad of Jed Clambit. The thing down, blah, blah, blah. Agree this parody. Oh, here's the, something. Uh, Mark Upfler, the leader of Dire Straits, agreed to the parody if he was allowed to play the guitar line. So here's the thing. That's kind of funny because years later, Weird Al would be blocked from uh, doing a uh, Slim Shady parody. Oh. 
because Eminem did not want to get in on the humor. So I'll say it right, right now. Dire Straits is way better than Eminem, in my opinion. Yeah, but when you think about it, is, uh, isn't Eminem's, uh, well, I, I won't say whole MO humor, but isn't he in for humor? No, he's is Eminem. I'm, I, hopefully I'm not getting this mixed up. But he is, he is trying to be intense and serious and th- say he's had a hard life. Uh, could be the song. Even now, as he's a millionaire music producer who can, once upon a time he couldn't afford to even buy uh, diapers for his daughter. Now he can buy diaper factories. <laughs> now, honestly, I I think having a sense of humor wouldn't kill him. True. But either way, I digress because, well, we're talking about UHF. But I'm curious if this if this music video was made for this movie and continued onwards. I think it was made for this movie because um, one of the lawyers insists that the song be called Beverly Hill Hillbilly slash Money for Nothing, a title where El publicly states he hated the dream sequence is a short for short remake of the music video Money for Nothing with Beverly Hillbilly's motif and we're out. Yeah, it's understandable. Which leads us into the third form of humor, reference humor. This is done, everyone gets a a little moment of this. Case in point, I was too young to appreciate this, but but when I saw a scene where George has basically sculpted a mountain out of mashed potatoes, and he looks at at Terry and says, this is important. (laughs) This means something. I had not yet seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but that is a direct reference. Then later, as they're delivering badgers to this insane man's home (laughs) next to the pile of dead dog... He goes, badgers, we don't need those thinking badgers. And if you don't get that reference, I for you. So every now and again, there's a there's a little peppering of uh, jokes and humor and references. So you're like, oh, he talked about the thing that I know that is a thing. I find that funny. It's probably the shortest line of humor in the movie. But, but uh, I, I think we talk about Kino for a bit, but... The wheel of fish part, like, oh my god, that is just... The setup was just too good. Oh my god. And it's just his portrayal. I mean, this energetic, screechy host. I wouldn't mind... I'm not sure how long I would enjoy it, but I wouldn't mind trying that on real TV. Because it's... I I guess it's the concept. Because you spin a wheel of fish that's already stupid, and you get the excited person... You know, just excited because he got a big prize. And when they bring out the mystery gift, like, oh, uh, what, do I get the thing that I know that I have? Or do I go for the mystery prize? What do I What do I go for? What do I go for? Oh, I go for the mystery prize. And <laughs> revelation of mystery prize is nothing. <laughs> the way that Kino delivers it is like, like it's nothing! <laughs> The way he screeches shit and the way he she he berates the contestant for just <laughs> how stupid she is. Oh my god. Ah, oh man, that's just so memorable. But it's at this point that the plot begins to assert itself for uh, George's uncle's gambling addiction puts him in the hole for $75,000. Which, you know, even, even without inflation, that sounds like a pretty heap in amount. Also, his, his the guy trying to collect on the debt is apparently uh, Charlie from Charlie's Angels. Oh, really? We, well, no, but we, we never see his face, just his hand. And Oh, the things he does with that hand. Oh, I, I thought it was a... Mm, Inspector Gadget villain. Who was it again? Oh, Dr. Claw? Yeah, something in reference to that. So you have to go more with uh, Charlie's Angels in this case. Not gravelly enough. Mm, probably. Actually, it's quite, quite smooth talking, in fact. He's a smooth <sighs> operator. But this then leads to R.J. Fletcher. Oh, that R.J. Fletcher trying to buy out Ch- Channel 62 to turn it into either a parking lot or a grocery store or something else. So, good Lord. So, it becomes a mad rush to get to raise the money in two days. Yeah. <laughs> All while continuing the programming of Conan the Librarian or Gandhi 2. This time it's personal. <laughs> Yep. 
Oh man, the the shorts, the clips are just too awesome here because what you you, you get Conan the Librarian and oh man, Conan the Librarian is just too good. <laughs> And yes, George does get to take the absurdist role for just a little bit as a talk show host. As But again, I feel like it's his guest. I mean, you have a clanner right next to a little girl in pigtails. And it's the little girl who's biting shins as the clanner's head gets collapsed by a, a thrown chair. So it's like, well, I'm okay with this. Mm-hmm. Again, you throw a dog out, out the window, I'm horrified. You <laughs> smash a clanner upside the head? Eh. Oh, Let's say something about you, Silva. <laughs> With the news that, uh, what you call this, RJ Fletcher is going to buy out Channel 62, uh, George and the crew decides to create a teleton. And it's a very interesting concept here. Uh, what was it again, Silva? What? A, a telethon? That's, I, honestly, I don't find that terribly interesting. We call them begathons because basically you interrupt all the programming to have people talking about how great the programming is. True, but and it take, um, what they ask here is not for donations, but a business proposition. Ah, uh, yes, to to sell one share in the company so it becomes truly community owned, mm-hmm. and one share for ten dollars. By the way, which honestly, for one share, that's probably steep. But this was what nineteen eighty nine, so which means ten dollars is even steeper, probably. But either way, it's their means to create a counter proposal to R. J. Fletcher. Oh, that R. J. And they're doing pretty well because again, Stanley, with all his absurdity, is a man of the people. Mm-hmm. So of course, this is where uh, Fletcher and his network become true, true cliche villains is that they kidnap stanley and i don't know if the if the guys holding him are meant to be satires of actual uh mob movies because suddenly they're trying to be all imposing and intimidating as they hold him in the station i mean it's not like he's being held in a random warehouse or some such he's in the station and basically what we get is a roller coaster finish Truly, the, in my eyes, the real climax is as weird as George, Weird Al, rushes to the rescue, having learned where his friend is being kept. Uh, he envisions himself as Rambo. <laughs> and Rambo, I mean, it's, it's all the cliches that you can have everyone firing bullets and he goes untouched. Or that he just screams at the top of his lungs and things explode left and right. I mean, there's a scene where he catches a bullet in his teeth, chews it out, and, and machine gun fires out of, his, out of said mouth. <laughs> Like George Doug, you'll get you'll get lead poisoning. So it that's probably the 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 last truly hilarious hurrah, in my opinion. So for me, that's the climax. Everything after that is almost denouement. Because they get a chase scene, but once again, it's Cooney, who may be the unsung hero of the entire movie. The greatest humor, the greatest skit, and now comes to rescue everyone from the mob. Uh and of course they rescue Stanley. And karma comes full swing as our heroes are able to save their be- their uh, station, which is now truly for the people, by the people, owned by the, and also an alien. Wait, what? No, I'm not talking about bad hombres. No, I'm talking about that the mad scientist dude who installed surveillance equipment to help, slant, uh, to help defame R.J. Fletcher and uh, who basically has been the the technical wizard behind it all he gives a literal i must go my planet needs me <laughs> and i'll be honest, as a kid seeing his transformation did freak me out a little i was eight years old it's funnier now but at the time i was like what the heck ah! wow. my father often recounts that whenever my de- my brother and i would be scared at movies we wouldn't hide under the seats we'd be on top of his head <laughs> grabbing and holding on for dear life ah! Yeah, I I can see why I I can see why you're freaked out like that. That there is yeah freaky, <laughs> freaky dicky, and it goes completely unremarked as he teleports back to his home planet. So he was too he was too weird and wonderful for this world. Oh yeah, Pucci got to go home. <laughs> now Terry re- uh, re- reconciles with George. I forgot to mention a, a scene in the midst of 
uh, Channel 62's Meteoric Rise in the ratings to become number one. They uh, George leaves uh, flowers taped to the front of her door with duct tape. Oops. It's not exactly the most romantic image, but the thought is there. Then she goes inside and he is broken into her home and left behind <laughs> an array of I love you uh, balloons saying that life has no meaning without her and a neon sign. And in some ways this is funny, absurdist in its extremes, but it's also creepy as hell. I mean, if someone did that to my home, I would change all the locks, call the police, and get a restraining order. There is also- I mean, I, I, again, I get I get funny humor in extremes, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, no, no, no I'm like, no. <laughs> Uh, but Terry, run, run! This this is not going to be healthy. Oh, <clears throat> oh man! But still, it, it it could be worse. Oh man! Well, but they do reconcile. The debt is paid. Everyone is happy. Uh, Pamela Finkelstein gets to interview R.J. Fletcher as he's not only lost his bid to own the another network, he's lost his backing from the F, uh, from the FCC. So basically, he screwed. Wait, it's not FCC. FCC, if I don't remember, uh, right? Because they're on the what you call this wiki page. I'm trying to remember. It's uh, I get my acronyms mixed up. Most I've been thinking of the CDC most <laughs> recently. Yeah, that, that's relevant. Uh, they say there's oh, an yes. FCC man. So yeah. Yes, FCC, Federal Communications Commission. So they, basically, because they yeah. failed to renew their license, and because he's just such a prick, they lose their backing. And we get, of course, even even the guy who was asking for change, he's the one who saves the day. So again, it's the underdogs pulling together to beat the man. Yeah, and- who, who, funny enough, is punished by the government and the system. <laughs> Which says something about this movie. Well, I mean, it often happens. As much as we usually go against the man being like uh, a business, an entity that sees itself outside the law, and we look yet rely on the law and the government to somehow bring reparations because they are the only ones who can hold that kind of power accountable. Even though we are still thoroughly pissed at our government and systems. Eh. I think I don't I don't think that's a controversial statement. I think that's just fact. True that, but still it's one of those cases where we vote in the people that we vote for. I didn't vote for him. Well he won. <laughs> With the fewest votes. But that's for November. Yeah, yeah, true, yeah. So, and so we get one final romantic uh, fantasy w- between George and Terry. Terry is now a brunette. I don't know what that really says. But that's our happy ending. Yeah, and also it's a reference to Gone to the Wind. In the, gone into the Wind or Gone to the Wind? Uh, go, gone with, yeah, the, with wind. the Wind. Gone with the Wind. freely tries to say why not. <laughs> and thus UHF continues but the big question is did stanley get his mop back and the answer is yes Yay. stanley got his mop back i'm so happy i'm all choked up please don't question my masculinity if i cry it's all good man it's all good and yeah and that's uhf uh a series a show that one would never make it today yeah with how silly and absurd it is like here's the thing um mel brooks kind of show can work for its time but as time goes on with movies like the insert movie here trope dies out those kind of movies don't have a place in our modern society anymore which kind of is sad like the parody movies they used to have a home in our media like what uh, we have what hot shots we have airplanes. We have a lot. Uh, uh, top, what was it again? Uh, Naked Gun and stuff. Like those kind of movies work. I, uh, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. Th- that worked too. Like those quote unquote were uh, parody movies. They were, but they were parodies of one story. The problem with insert your movie here movies is that they try to parody five at once sometimes without even seeing the full movie 
just going by a trailer. Yeah, it, and in doing so, they have no identity. Yeah, and it's that, that is another topic for another day because I feel like uh, the parody movies of Beyond the Years versus uh, insert movie here or whatever it is kind of missed the point. Like, yes, you copy the original or copy m- moments from movies and stuff, but you don't really understand the heart of it. Like, mm, Hot Shots. Uh, maybe Hot Shots is not a good one. Like, Naked Gun. Those are parody movie of uh, what you might call this that uh, Clint Eastwood movie. What detective movies, hard boiled cop movies, yeah, hard boiled cop crime, no. crimes like there's uh, Dirty Harry, like yeah. it's a it's a parody of that. But instead of having your lead character be a rough and tough uh, man, you get a. Uh, almost senile old dude which is kind of silly and funny in its own way either way uh, this one in some ways it is a parody of the underdog story against the man Uh, playing up the absurdity of the underdogs except again I guess this is the thing I scratched my head over George himself is relatively downplayed and for a guy whose moniker is Weird Al that's well, odd in itself. Yeah. I, I feel like the movie, even though Weird Al is the lead, <laughs> Weird Al is the lead, but he's not the star, if you know what I mean. Like, the star of the movie are the oddballs that run the station or have uh, or do shows for the station because. Uh, like you mentioned before, George's part in it is really tame. He doesn't really play that much of a role. Like Stanley is one of the uh, lead characters that people remember. Uh, we see shows like what? Um, I'm trying to remember. Like uh, Conan the Librarian, uh, Gundy too, and uh, the ads that they have on TV. Like... <laughs> We see the car salesman. He has great, awesome deals. Uh, come to the store, or else I'll clap a seal. <laughs> oh God, that one! <laughs> that was dumb. That was that was earlier on before the station got popular. <laughs> uh, honestly, I think it would have been funny to later find out that the seal club did that. <laughs> yeah, it's right. it can work. It can work. But still, uh, it's one of those things where this movie, <laughs> it's. It's absurd, but it's not too absurd. It's funny, but it's not, how would I put say, dumb humor? The, the jokes in this movie are pretty smart, if you agree. I'd say they play up the absurdity. You don't have to think about them too much. You just realize, hey, that's pretty weird. And you get the humor. Mm, true. And it, you don't have to have an English major to understand the lines and whatnot it's it's just there it's simple uh stupid one of the stupid thing is just that um kid won a prize what is his prize he gets to drink out of the fire hide fire hose it's amazing he's not dead (laughs) that is already absurd to itself (laughs) i I actually think you found the marble in the oatmeal (laughs) Like wow, that's that's what you're doing. And celebrity mud wrestling. Why not? We've, we had celebrity deathmatch for a while. With, uh, Gorbachev. <laughs> so that's the humor. It's sort of a wait, what? Yeah. But like I say, there's multiple forms of humor. There's there's reference humor. There's absurdity. There's extreme reactions or just simple shock value. And some of it works. Some doesn't. Depending on who you are. This movie is. It's interesting in its own way. Like, I I find the part where the wildlife guy is <laughs> uh, maybe it's my dark sense of humor, but I find it funny where um, he he has this reaction where okay, I throw p- poodle out the window to see it fly. Oh no, it didn't uh. work. Never mind. Uh, it takes time for them to learn how to fly. <laughs> 
a pile of dead boy, dead dogs there. I mean, it's grim. I I don't know why I I had a chuckle. It's, it's not a good one, but still, I had a chuckle. But still, oh boy. Anything more to add, Silver? Because I could just go on and on like Kung Pao. Well, I will. My final thought is this. Weird Al ages in reverse. Without that mustache and glasses, he looks in his 20s. He looks older in this movie than he looks right now. <laughs> that is true. I am so jealous. It is true. Oh, man. Yeah, the the what mas- the mustache glasses really ate him up. So I just find that funny. Uh, and this wasn't Weird Al's only uh, acting role. I mean, he did play. He did do a couple TV specials for a new album. I remember seeing one on Disney where he was allowed to be a bit more as he is in his in his songs, just absurdist. Mm-hmm. But again, it's sort of that, wait, what? Humor? And so that's his style. I, In some ways, I, I feel like this role didn't really play to his strengths. He wasn't allowed to be weird. He may have made a world that's weird. But Weird Al should not be forced to be the straight man. I, I guess. But I feel like if he was strange or he were to play the eccentric one, it kind of overshadowed the whole sh- story i don't know like i understand what you mean but i feel like this was not bad like i understand why he did it and i don't know how we would change it like if you were to put him as this strange guy like it would overshadow stanley so much that's true stanley stand is able to stand out because he's the weird Mm -hmm. one if he's supposed to be the flagship of this new network or rather this new tv station then yeah, he's got to be the oddball. Yeah. I think they represented it in this way where Weird Al tries to be the Howdy Doody um, representation show where they get kids and whatnot to watch the show and, whatnot, and so on. But he failed. He failed hard where knowing that the sh- station is going to go bankrupt, he just gave up and decides to start drinking. And gave the show to Stanley just because he don't care anymore. Like, just imagine this. Uh, buildings on fire, just give the janitor a job. No, give the janitor a screen position on your TV station. To be surprised where he is popular somehow. Like, wait, what? In the span of minutes, by the way, he somehow got the hearts and mind of the community to enjoy him or just appreciate or just like what he did or do just being himself and one of the few things i noticed is that stanley here is honest he speaks from the heart he knows how to deliver lines like he (laughs) technically he's just not he's not delivering any lines he's just speaking from the heart and i think that's why the community the people enjoy him or appreciate him he has this charisma where on screen he's just awesome off screen he's a good friend and so this movie goes for the heart in fact, in uh, one scene, I believe that Gandhi punches a guy through the heart. <laughs> I thought it was the guts. Oh, God. All right. But with UHF ce- celebrated, I may not remember it as fondly as I did as a kid, but that's that sometimes shows your style of humor changes as you get older. And that's not a bad thing. It was fun. There's still some very likable parts to it. It's not my go-to comedy movie, however. Yeah, there's a lot of other comedy movies that came out after this. And yeah, there's a lot. Like, seriously, there's a lot. But for me, this one was kind of memorable. I, I like this one because it has my favorite artists performing. And the story is just silly and fun. But now we look to the future and a return to the ponies. Mm-hmm. And talking about bad things... Bad thing number three will be the next episode title. <laughs> oh, yes, a return to pony life. Is it a sweet life, though? 
Is it? I don't know, but in this episode, Rarity tries to get rid of her bad luck before it can ruin her relationship with a new friend, and she receives some much-needed advice from an ex- with from an unexpected source herself. Hmm. Anywho, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at dimitrogmail.com. You can also reach us on the Twitter. The show's Twitter page or the show's Twitter account is at the show, and my personal Twitter account is at Norman Sanzo. Silver, where can the good people find you? Well, you can seek me out on both Twitter and DeviantArt under MLP Silver Quill. You can also support my videos and comics by going to Patreon or Kofi under Silver Quill. Uh, if you do a search on YouTube for After the Fact or, again, Silver Quill, you shall find me. And on Wednesdays, you can find me posting editorials and reviews on EquestriaDaily.com. Yay, go check him out, guys. Those contents are gold. And also, please subscribe to us on iTunes, YouTube. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date and search radio. And also, like our Facebook page. You can also catch us on PonyLive.com. Links are in the show notes. If you would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash show. With every support, you get a week's early access to review discussion podcast, exclusive and deleted content. And a huge thank you for me. Talking about thank yous, I would like to thank Knight, Jeffrey, Tristan, and also Master of Light. Thank you so much, guys. You are great. So anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Cecilia Vakril. And we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode. Yes, show. See ya. You get nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> stupid. You... This reference is so stupid. <laughs> uh, guess me every time. <laughs>